This video is brought to you by Squarespace from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Once upon a time, it was thought to be nothing special, just an inert rock circling Jupiter, another pockmarked moon in a solar system full of them. But if that was how humanity once viewed Ganymede, things today couldn't be more different. Within recent memory, Jupiter's third major moon has undergone the sort of re-evaluation disgraced celebrities can only dream of. It's now one of space exploration's hottest properties, the star of an upcoming mission by the ESA, and it all comes down to a single word, water. A deep, lightless ocean of water hidden beneath an icy surface. An ocean that may hold that most precious thing of all. Life. First hypothesized in the 1970s and only confirmed in 2015, Ganymede's subsurface ocean is today the subject of frenzied speculation. A discovery that might conceivably change our entire understanding of the cosmos. And yet, exciting as this is, there's more to this mission than just a lightless sea. The largest natural satellite in our solar system, Ganymede, is a world of mystery and wonder. From its unique magnetic field to its spooky auroras, it's simply begging to be explored. A wish uh, we will now, in video form at least, attempt to fulfill. One point zero seven million kilometers from its parent planet Jupiter orbits a moon unlike any other. The third of the Galilean satellites, the Jovian moons discovered by the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei, Ganymede sits between its siblings Europa and Callisto, a grey and white world streaked with shining ice and pitted with impact craters. But while it was named after a mythological figure known for his beauty, it's not Ganymede's appearance that makes it so distinctive. Rather, it's the moon's sheer size. With a radius of 2,631 kilometers, Ganymede is simply the largest natural satellite in our solar system. A world so large it makes our own moon look like Kim Jong-un stood beside Dennis Rodman. Nor is it just moons that tremble before the giant. So big is Ganymede, it dwarfs not only dwarf planets like Pluto, but also fully sized worlds like Mercury. In fact, the only object to even come close to Ganymede's radius that isn't a planet is Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Yet, while Titan's opaque atmosphere makes it appear slightly bigger, even this moon, literally named after giants, can't compete with our solar system's big daddy. So, yeah, Ganymede kind of a big deal. Especially if you happen to be one of Jupiter's other moons. Because it's so vast, Ganymede also has significant gravity. And that's important because it orbits in resonance with the moons Io and Europa. On its seven-day path around Jupiter, Ganymede will witness Europa zip around twice and Io four times. That means the three are constantly tugging at one another, their gravity competing with Jupiter's in a cosmic game of tug-of-war, albeit one with crazy effects. This thanks to the friction from this pulling that Io, for example, example, is a world of volcanoes and fire, that Europa is warm enough to sustain its own subsurface ocean. Take gigantic Ganymede out of the picture, and the lives of these two satellites suddenly look a lot less interesting, a lot colder and duller. And speaking of which, that's exactly what you'd experience should you ever stop by to visit. At 778 million kilometers from the Sun, Ganymede gets barely one thirtieth of the sunlight that we get on Earth, less even than Scotland gets in November. With the Sun reduced to a mere dot in the sky, this moon's surface only experiences the faintest warming. On a good day, it might reach minus 112 degrees Celsius. On a bad day, it might hover at a brutal 182 Celsius below zero. Remarkably, there is an atmosphere, one even composed of oxygen. But it's so thin, it can't retain any heat. And so the frozen world shivers away, never warming enough for its ice to melt. And that's mostly what Ganymede's surface is. Ice, a giant shell of ice, almost 160 kilometers thick. Not that you'd immediately guess that by looking at it. While other icy worlds like Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus are highly reflective, Ganymede's surface is a mixture of light and dark. Overall, the dark patches make up 40% of the terrain, terrain that, with its countless ancient craters, seems as old as any surface in our solar system. By contrast, the lighter regions are cracked and patterned, lined with ridges that run for thousands of kilometers, soaring to almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. The relative lack of impact craters suggests these lighter areas might be younger, perhaps renewed by the same geological churning that seems to keep Europa's surface fresh. Fascinating as all this is, though, it's what's beneath the ice that makes Ganymede truly interesting. It's time to buckle up, because the next leg of our journey is going to take us down into the dark, down where it's wetter and arguably better. 
We're going into Ganymede's subsurface ocean. That we ever discovered Ganymede's hidden ocean is entirely down to another equally remarkable discovery. In the 1990s, a NASA probe orbiting Jupiter discovered that Ganymede has its own intrinsic magnetosphere. Now, magnetic fields in and of themselves aren't that rare. Jupiter has one, Mercury has one, Earth is the reason you're hopefully not dying of solar radiation damage as you watch this. But this was something else. To this day, we've still not discovered another moon with its own magnetic field. Moons with induced magnetic fields caused by a larger object's magnetosphere. Sure, moons like our moon that once had magnetic fields but no longer do are also a tick. But Ganymede is the only natural satellite we know of that's currently generating its own. We can even see the evidence. At the poles, hot, electrified gas sometimes forms into bright auroras, a byproduct of the magnetosphere. At this stage, you might be thinking, well, that's pretty cool, but what does it have to do with secret oceans and alien fish? And the answer, it turns out, is everything. Because Ganymede is so close to Jupiter, it orbits within Jupiter's own gigantic magnetosphere. When Jupiter's magnetic field changes, it affects Ganymede's far weaker one. The result is those funky aurorae at the moon's poles shifting slightly, resulting in a rocking motion. And now for the confusing part. According to NASA, this rocking is totally expected. From what we know of science, the aurorae should be thrown out by six degrees every time Jupiter's magnetosphere changes. But that's not what happens. Instead, Ganymede's light show rocks by only two degrees. That means there must be something generating a secondary magnetic field that counteracts the effects of Jupiter. And you know what would generate the exact right amount of magnetic friction to produce this outcome? A global subsurface ocean of salty water. In all honesty, the science here is kind of above our pay grades. We're just a history channel that moves into doing science stuff sort of by accident. But lots of super clever dudes and dudettes with impressive qualifications say this proves the existence of an ocean under the ice and, well, who are we to argue? If it's down there, that ocean is so vast it contains more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. And it's also really dark. With the ice of Ganymede's shell estimated at 160 kilometers thick or 100 miles in America, f yeah, units, there would be no natural light, nothing but the endless churning of an ink black sea, a sea that may have a depth of up to 100 kilometers. Or maybe make that the churning of ink black seas, plural. One of the strangest theories about Ganymede's ocean was proposed back in 2014, and it still walks that beautiful line between rigorous scientific vision and something dreamt up while being both extremely clever and extremely stoned. Known as the Club Sandwich Model, it asks us to imagine not just a subsurface ocean with its own seafloor, but many of them. A layer of oceans stacked atop one another, leading all the way down to the rocky mantle. It sounds like science fiction, like a wet version of one of the shell worlds from the culture novel Matter. But it might just be possible, thanks to the insanely high pressures that exist below Ganymede's shell. We laymen tend to think of water ice as simple, a straightforward thing. Ice is ice is ice. At high pressures, though, ice starts becoming more compact. This leads to the creation of things like ice 2 or ice 6, which are too dense to float in water. The club sandwich model suggests that these denser ices would create the insane pressure of Ganymede's ocean. The denser ice would sink, eventually leading to a steady state where you have up to three layers of ice, each separated by a band of ocean that never interacts with the other layers. It sounds nuts, and we need to stress that it's only a theory. While the model checks out, nobody knows for sure the true state of Ganymede's sunless seas. It does raise an interesting question, though, one which could have profound and profoundly weird answers. How might this affect the evolution of life? All right, we'll get back to our video in just a second. But first, here's a word from today's excellent video sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching into their savings accounts to start a new business or launch a new blog to share their opinions with family and friends. The world is yours, and Squarespace is the platform to use when you're ready to get started on the next web project that you've been thinking of. You need to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like. Well, use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person. You've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. While Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to worry about. And when you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 20% customer support, everything you need 
in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. In our solar system right now, there are two moons that we consider prime candidates in the search for life, Europa and Enceladus. In both cases, these are icy worlds with deep subsurface oceans that have remained stable for perhaps billions of years. In both cases, there's the chemical stew you get when salt water, like in our earthly seas, interacts with rocky mantle. And both have plausible energy sources tidal heating. Remember that talk in chapter 1 about the orbital resonance? Well, Europa and Enceladus are both trapped between the gravity of their host planet and that of another moon, with the tugging between them causing tidal friction. Scientists are pretty sure this heats the moons enough for hydrothermal vents to arise in their oceans, prime destinations on Earth for microbial life to evolve. But while Enceladus and Europa are the darlings of astrobiologists, you may have noticed something about that description of their habitability. All of it could equally apply to Ganymede. Like a sister moon Europa, Ganymede has briny water, and that water lightly interacts with the rocky mantle on the ocean floor. Like its sibling, Ganymede also gets tugged around in the game of orbital resonance. Although in this case, scientists think the effects are weaker. Still, there should theoretically be enough tidal heating to create tectonic activity and perhaps lead to the rise of hydrothermal vents. So, let's assume the models are right, and there's a small energy source down at the bottom of this ocean of night. Let's assume that the seafloor really is rocky mantle, rather than a layer of ice six or something that sank to the bottom. If the ingredients for life are there, what might that life look like? The short answer, it'd be small. While we all might desperately want to hear tales of freaky space jellyfish, the likelihood is any life that has evolved on Ganymede is microbial. There just isn't likely to be the energy down there to support creatures of large biomasses, especially since they'll be using chemosynthesis for energy. But small and simple isn't the same as boring. Even if you forget the sheer wonder of discovering life evolved separately in our solar system, even the simplest ecosystem on Ganymede could be profoundly different to anything we've ever seen. With only a sample size of one, the Earth, our mental picture of what alien life might look like is inevitably formed by what we see around us. But even the hardiest extremophiles have a common ancestor with everything else. So far below Ganymede's ice shell, there's simply no way any life forms would share a lineage with terrestrial creatures. All of which is a fancy way of saying there could be some seriously strange critters down there. Since the basic goal of all living things is to get more sustenance to create energy, we should expect complexity in even the most basic microbial ecosystems, forms of predators and prey that perhaps we've never even dreamt of. It's even been suggested that if the club sandwich model is correct, each layer of ocean might be home to life forms that have spent billions of years evolving separately from one another. And just like an isolated evolution in Australia produced the ultimate weirdness that is the platypus, so too might each ocean house creatures that are alien even to one another. Now, it is important that we include our usual disclaimer here. Just because somewhere is inhabitable doesn't mean it is necessarily inhabited. Ganymede could just be a giant floating ball of disappointment as far as evolution is concerned. Not that we have any way of checking, though. While Enceladus and Europa both have oceans so close to the surface that water sometimes erupts out in geysers, Ganymede's seas are locked tightly away, as inaccessible to modern science as your ex's heart. But that doesn't mean there aren't still things we could learn from this mysterious moon. In fact, there are already missions planned that could upend everything we think we know about the Jovian system. For most of human history, the thought of exploring Ganymede would have been as bizarre as I don't know, seeing the Foo Fighters team up with Elvis Costello to fight White Snake. The extremely bizarre. In other words, that's for the very good reason that no one knew Jupiter's largest moon existed. While it's technically possible to see Ganymede with the naked eye, in practice it's always so close to its parent planets that distinguishing it is near impossible. So when Sidereus Nuncius was published in March 1610, it created an unholy storm. Based on telescope observations taken by Galileo Galilei just two months earlier, the book marked the first time that the world learned about Ganymede and its largest siblings, Europa, Callisto 
and Io. This is why Jupiter's biggest satellites are today called the Galilean moons in honor of their discoverer, although interestingly, Galileo didn't get to name them. In what was perhaps history's greatest consolation prize, the names we use today came from Simon Marius, who independently discovered the satellites just one evening after Galileo, although his choices seem to have been a little, well, Odd. As Marius wrote of the mythological figure he named the largest moon after, the boy Ganymede greatly pleased lustful Jupiter. Make of that what you will. Still, while Ganymede was known, there was little thought of exploring it. For the next 350 years, it was simply too remote, too beyond the limits of human ability. It wasn't until 1973 that humanity was ready to do what Galileo could never have dreamed of doing. Visit Ganymede. That December, the NASA probe Pioneer 10 swung past Jupiter's largest moon, transmitting back our first ever glimpse of this far-off ice world. Because these were the early days of space exploration, the image today looks pretty unimpressive, a vaguely moon-shaped blur against a dark background. Still, it was a start, and one scientists would soon improve upon. A mere six years after Pioneer 10 visited, the two Voyager probes swung through the Jovian system, returning pictures that are still capable of making the little hairs on the back of the neck stand up. Gone was the blurry ball of 1973. In its place were images of a strange alien world, a world streaked with light and dark, a world flecked with impact craters of brilliant white. A world we well, were seeing clearly for the first time in history. Awesome as these photos were, uh, they were still just the starters. The Horde d'oeuvre in the coming Jovian banquet. It would be the next mission, the one named after Ganymede's discoverer that really changed everything. Launched in 1989, the Galileo probe was one of the all-time greatest NASA hits, ranking up there with the Cassini mission to Saturn in the Discovery Stakes. Intended to explore the entire Jovian system, it arrived at the fifth planet in 1995, conducting its first flyby of Ganymede in June the following year. Not long after, it beamed back evidence of Ganymede's magnetosphere, the discovery that, you'll recall, would soon be used to confirm the moon's hidden ocean. Sadly, though, this scientific bonanza couldn't last. The Galileo probe visited Ganymede for the final time in December 2000. While the New Horizons craft would take some readings as it zoomed past on its way to Pluto, it would do so at a great distance. After that last meeting with Galileo, no other probe would visit Ganymede for over 20 years. It's kind of incredible when you think about it. At the moment Galileo first encountered Jupiter's largest moon, the Supreme Court was busy weighing in on Bush and Gore. The Twin Towers were still standing. No one knew oh, what a Facebook was. By the time we next visited it, in the summer of 2021, in a flyby by the Juno craft, Joe Biden was president. We'd had a massive pandemic, and Vladimir Putin was secretly planning how to utterly humiliate himself in Ukraine. Given how interesting Ganymede is. It seems a crazy shame that the world has to wait so long between visits. But then that space exploration for you, expensive, difficult, and often relying on comparative scraps of data. That 2021 Juno visit was only made possible by extending the craft's mission, and even that only resulted in the briefest of flybys. Luckily, though, there are now plans underway to explore Ganymede in much greater detail, to not just send a probe whooshing past it, but to place one into orbit. Yes, it's time for the best part of these space videos, the part where we look to the future and the unbelievably cool missions that are soon going to be taking place. Of all the probes mentioned in this video, Galileo, Juno, New Horizons, Cassini, none is quite so awkwardly named as JUICE. A not quite acronym of Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE is the brainchild of the European Space Agency, one of the continent's biggest current projects. But if its name might be a bit dumb, the same can't be said for the mission itself. Scheduled to launch in spring of 2023, JUICE will be the first probe to ever orbit an alien moon. That's going to be all sorts of exciting. So far, we've had plenty of conduct flybys of our solar system's satellite. We've even had the Huygens probe land on Saturn's moon, Titan. But actually orbiting a moon other than our own? That's brand new. And since you already know the subject of this video, you could probably guess which moon Juice will end up orbiting. First though, it'll need to complete a complex and spectacular mission. Arriving in orbit around Jupiter in 2031, Juice will spend the first two and a half years of its life traveling the Jovian system, checking in on the Galilean moons. Well, most of them. As its full name suggests, the intention here is to explore the ice worlds, which excludes fiery volcanic Io. Nor will it spend much time around Europa. By a quirk of timing, Juice will arrive in the Jovian system around the same time as NASA's Europa Clipper mission. With the Clipper entirely focused on Europa, which it'll perform over 40 flybys of, there's little need for Juice to visit. It'll only swing by Europa twice. The rest of his lifespan, it'll reserve entirely for Callisto and Ganymede. 
The most mysterious of the Galilean satellites, Callisto is thought by some to likewise contain a subsurface ocean, although others think there's just nothing there. Over 12 flybys, Juice would hopefully answer this question, as well as capturing reams of new data on this lesser studied world. The real meat of its mission, though, will be Ganymede. Across a dozen flybys, the probe will swing within 200 kilometers of Ganymede's surface, revealing this alien world in stunning high-resolution detail. That done, it will finally enter into Ganymede's orbit, where it will stay for at least nine months. Nine months in which it might turn all science on its head. And that's because JUICE has been designed to not just examine the structure of this icy moon, but also to hunt for traces of organics, the building blocks of life. And if there really is something down there in the ocean, it may just have left a biosignature, a telltale sign we can look at and say, it probably came from an organic process. Were Juice to detect such a signature, it would be hitting the space exploration lottery, a solid sign that Ganymede isn't just conductive to life, but may be home to alien microbes. Sadly, proving this won't be easy. At the moment, the deepest vertical hole we've ever dug as a species extends down a mere 7.6 kilometers into the Earth's crust. To get to the seas of Ganymede, we need to dig 21 times that distance, all while maintaining our drilling equipment on the frozen surface of an alien moon over 770 million kilometers from our planet. It's as impossible for us today as flying to Jupiter would have been for Galileo Galilei. But really though, frustration at our current tech level absolutely isn't what you should be taking from this video. Rather, it should be a sense of wonder. At some point in the next decade, we're going to have two probes in the Jovian system, both dedicated to finding traces of alien life. Two probes that will explore the surfaces of Ganymede and Europa, searching for signs of what may lie in their lightless oceans. It could be that neither of these probes detects anything. It could be that they pick up a contested biosignature, something that could point toward microbial life or just a natural process. Or it could be that one of them returns solid data that strongly implies the rarest of things, life. So that's where we're going to leave things for now, as we so often do, on a cliffhanger, on the promise of more to come just a few years down the line. Whatever it is that Juice ultimately uncovers on its mission, we hope this video has made one thing clear. Far from being an inert ball of ice, Ganymede may be one of the most interesting objects in our solar system, an object that deserves all of our attention.